<clears throat> is we're going to continue on <clears throat> where we left off with the Nike uh, valuation. And we're going to finish it off by doing the bull bear and the target and talk about next week's assignment. Okay? So just to, to pick up where we left off, uh, last week <clears throat> and for your homework assignment today, you should have done an as-is valuation of Nike. Uh, and if you followed what we did in class, you should have come within four cents of their share price last week. Okay? So hopefully everybody has a, a model that's working. So in the 11 a.m. section, unfortunately, there were some people who did not have a, a working model. So what I'm going to do <clears throat> is I'm going to post this file as a solution uh, to Elms so that if you don't have a working file, you can use the solution file to continue on, because otherwise you're not going to be able to do the upcoming assignments without a working file. And at this point, you need a working file. So you're welcome to use the solution file. Now, if you have yours working, you can match it, you don't need the solution file, but if you're, some of the people who are struggling at least want to give you something to work with. Okay? But back to the as is. <clears throat> so what we did is we said, okay, and this is something unique to this class, but we did a valuation of Nike as of last week to this price. And what we then did is we worked backwards and said, okay, given the price, what would the cash flows and the enterprise DCF have to be to get to that share price? And we talked about essentially the key drivers that got us there. And the key drivers that got us there were <clears throat> a WAC, a G, um, a long-term margin, and essentially the growth rate, the EBITDA margin, the tax rate, and potentially the balance sheet, which we left alone. Okay? And so if you want to think about the 80-20 of the model, like those are the most important things for our valuation. Okay? So by understanding those, <clears throat> we have a general understanding of why Nike is priced what it's priced today. Okay? So where we're going to go with this is that we now have to come up with a forecast share price for Nike, which <clears throat> in Wall Street parlance is going to be called the target share price. Okay? And it's a 12-month target. So if you were to go to Bloomberg and you were to go to Nike <clears throat> and you go to A&R, a sell-side team typically consists of three people. You have kind of like the lead analyst, you have an MBA, and you have an undergrad. And they create their own coverage universe. So, for example, Michael Benetti's team of Credit Suisse uh, has a coverage universe of 26 companies. Typically, it's between 10 and 15 companies. The team at the bank decides who they want to cover, so they decide how big their universe is. 26 is just hard because you're supposed to be specialists in all these companies, and it's hard to keep track of 26 companies. So like I said, 10 to 15 is, is usually more typical. But nonetheless, their job is to keep track of this industry, all of those companies, and that's what they're writing research on. <clears throat> now, when they write the research, as I said, two things happen. One, they submit their financial estimates that eventually become the earnings estimates of the EEO. And two, they write the buy-sell hold opinions, which go out to the clients in the research notes. And as part of their buy-sell hold, they come up with target share prices. So right now, the target share prices, you can see here, his 12-month target says that he reasonably believes that Nike is going to be worth $112 in 12 months. That's the target share price. Which, by the way, if you click on, you can see is updated from time to time. They're raising their target share price over time. Okay. Now, he's not the only one that's making guesses on target share prices. Sorry. Every time you trade, I get an email. Lots of trades. Back to my key. Figure out a way to stop all the emails. And our, all right. <clears throat> so basically, uh, he's not the only one that's guessing the share price. All these analysts are putting in their 12-month target share price for Nike, which is where they reasonably think Nike will trade in 12 months. What Bloomberg does is just averages them out. Okay, and that average. Throwing on out mathematical outliers becomes the 12-month target share price for Nike, $101.90. Now, right now, they're trading at 
So the return says the market, wisdom of the crowd, Nike's got 6.2% upside in the next 12 months if Wall Street's right. In the last 12 months, Nike's up 30.7%, right? So just on the surface of it, what that really tells me is it's not a lot of upside Nike right now. And it's not that Nike's not doing well. It's just they've had a really good run, and people kind of already expect them to do well. So it's kind of priced in. And that's what's in the estimates today, okay? But what's more important is they then come up with their buy, sell, hold opinions on that. So basically what a hold opinion says is if I think that the share price is going to be plus or minus 10% of what it is today, then that's considered a hold. It's called a trading range, okay? So if Nike's at 95, then basically anywhere between 104 on the top end and about, call it 80, what, 95 minus 9, 86 in the bottom end is uh, where I'll call it a hold, plus or minus 10%, right? So if I think it's going to do better than that, then I'll plus more than 10% higher, I'll call it a buy, and worse, I'll call it a sell. So for example, uh, you can see that Credit Suisse thinks they're going to be 112 equals buy, okay? Now, <clears throat> Bloomberg, because unfortunately, these analysts, for marketing purposes, come up with their own names. For example, outperform, uh, buy, overweight, all right, positive. So what they do is they kind of standardize the buy sell holds. So greens are buys, yellows are holds, reds are sells, and they point score them. So right now, buys are worth five points, twenty-four buys. Nine are holds are worth three points, and two sells, excuse me, one. So Nike is a four point two three out of five. Okay. But nonetheless, wisdom of the crowd, <clears throat> these are the average target share prices. So that's what we're communicating to our institutions about what we think Nike is worth. Now here's the next thing. When I give you a target share price, and Wall Street started doing this about five or six years ago, think about what risk is financially. Okay? In finance, risk is standard deviation. Okay, so if you plot risk and reward in a portfolio manager, the risk axis is standard deviation. Okay? So what I really care about in risk is variance. So let me say it a different way. If I'm a portfolio manager and you're telling me whether to buy Nike, and you say, I, I listen to Michael from Credit Suisse, and his firm says, what, 112, then I'm going to say, okay, I know what the return could be. Tell me how much volatility I can see in Nike stock. How high could it go? And how low could it go over the next 12 months? Because that's the other side that I care about, right? Because if I only think that Nike's got, you know, 6% upside, but 30% downside, well, that might actually affect my opinion on whether I want to put Nike in my portfolio. So it's not just tell me about the return, tell me about the volatility, tell me about the risk, okay? And that's where the bull and the bear comes in. Because right, increasingly what Wall Street's now starting to do is to say, it's not just enough to give you the target share price, I want to give you the range. Because you need to understand what that volatility could be. So last semester, this is a midterm question, <clears throat> a lot of people missed, and I've done in this past as homework assignments. So let's say that your answer is uh, plus or minus 10%. Buy Nike at this price plus or minus 10%. Is that a good answer? Yes or no? If your answer was plus or minus 10% as the range for Nike, is that a good answer? What do you think? I see some people shaking their heads. You're shaking your head. Uh, I'm just not sure where you got the 10% from. There you go. So you start to think like I do in the grading. I will give you no credit because you made it up. Sounds pretty arbitrary to me. You don't, don't, you don't do me a, a service as an analyst giving me an arbitrary range. Why not plus or minus 20? Why not plus 10 minus 15? You just made it up, right? Or worse, you took some technical analysis class and you told me that was their volatility historically. Well, great. How does that apply in the next three to five years again? Does the past always repeat itself? You know, I don't see that working out in the real world that well. So, so that's the next thing. Like, you got to give me a rationale for that range. And the range isn't always going to be symmetrical on either side. 
Okay, so hence the bull and the bear. So when we go through the analysis, we're about to do this for Nike, right? The first thing you're going to do is you're going to establish a range. And the range has to be a realistic range. But let's start out with a bear, or sorry, the bull. The bull is the positive. In the next 12 months, what could go right realistically in the next 12 months that could really benefit Nike? Okay, so let's put on our positive point of view, seeing the world through the rose-colored glasses. Everything that go right realistically goes right. What happens to Nike? What's that price? And what I care about is not just the number. I care also about your assumptions. You have to articulate your assumptions. Right? Why did you say it's going to be positive? Then you're going to put on your bear glasses and you're going to say, okay, let's say everything goes wrong. What could go wrong realistically and what does that mean for Nike? Okay? And so we're going to establish a range. Right? At the high end, is everything goes right. At the low end, everything goes wrong. Those are three different Excel files you now have. So your first one was your as is, the price today. Save as, bull, bear, which is the best case scenario. Bear, worst case scenario. And then final Excel file, your opinion, called the target. Where in that range, between that bull and the bear, do you think Nike is going to end up? Right? And I want to say that because last semester, comically, students actually turned in target stock prices that were outside their bull to bear range. Right? So I just failure myself to explain this. Your target must be within that range. Okay? So it's where along the continuum do you think the company is? And then, based on your opinion, is it plus or minus 10% of the current share price? Well, guess what? You have a hold. And then more than 10% buy, less than 10% sell. Okay. So for your next assignment, you're going to then write up all these assumptions in a minimum 500 word paper. Okay. So you're going to turn in eight files for your next assignment. And this is an individual assignment. It's not as scary as it sounds. Okay. So the company that you're going to do the next assignment on is called PVH, PVH Corp, PVH US Equity. Again, they're the global brand owner for a lot of clothes, including Tommy Hilfiger, Calvin Klein, uh, Speedo, uh, some other stuff. But basically, <clears throat> they are the company that we're going to analyze. And so you're going to do an as-is valuation, which we'll talk a little about later, remind ourselves how to do that, right? to move over the Nike model to be PVH. Save that file, turn that in. Then you're going to do a, a bull file, save that file, turn it in, which we'll talk about in a minute. Then you're going to do a bear file, save that file, turn it in. And then you're going to do a target file, save that file, turn it in. So those are the four Excel files that you'll turn in. And then <clears throat> you're going to give me three screenshots. You're going to give me the DES, which will have the share count and the share price. You're going to give me the WAC that you used. And then you're going to give me the EEO. Okay? And then finally, you're going to give me a 500-word paper, minimum, either PDF or Word doc, which is going to be run through Turnitin. So again, this is real world, so you can actually use real data. You just have to make sure that you don't uh, plagiarize somebody. But the flip side is, <clears throat> uh, what the paper is going to be about is explaining the actual assumptions you used. Why did you change what you changed across the models? All right. So if you think about it, you got four models. You got 125 words per model. That's a paragraph each. That's easy. But, they, but that's what matters. Like, I don't just want to hear that Nike's bull is 130. I need to know why. Okay. I want to hear that bear is 70. I need to know why. Like, what assumptions did you change and why are you changing them realistically when you went through this? Like, that's what's going to be very important for me, which we're going to talk about for Nike, but then we'll flip it over to uh, PVH. Does that make sense? So that's going to be your next graded homework assignment. So then this is the model, by the way, and this is the process that you could be using for your group projects. So just so you know, I want to also mention two other things. <clears throat> this assignment for PVH is going to be due next Monday. And Wednesday, because you'll need to use Bloomberg to get a lot of data, uh, I'm going to make Wednesday a Bloomberg lab day. So there's no lecture, but you're going to have access to the, the whole day. So again, I'm not giving extensions for people to just be really clear. There's no reason to have an extension for next Monday unless you're like horribly sick or something. So you got Wednesday's time in class to work on this as well. All right, but I want to make sure you have time to get the data out of the terminals. So I'm making it available. But I do want to put an asterisk on the data that you're going to get from the terminals. So <clears throat> this lab, I like to joke, used to be like Fight Club, right? Nobody talked about Fight Club and it was wonderful, right? So for years, it was like a dirty little secret. 
because we were the only people that used the lab and nobody knew it existed. But unfortunately, the word is out and people now know about 3505, particularly because the lab downstairs is awful. It's hard to get in, it's always overcrowded, and it's always jam-packed, where this lab is usually empty and it's pretty cool. But the reason I mention this is there's a real world problem that you may run into, which is on every single individual Bloomberg terminal, there is a monthly data export limit per terminal. And when that terminal hits its data export limit, it will not export any more data until the first of the next month, okay? And Bloomberg's data export limit is not based on amount of megabytes of data. It's actually based on dollar value of data. So Bloomberg has a proprietary dollar value assigned to all of their data. So for example, the cheapest data is basically financial statements. Right, because they're like, look, you can get that anywhere, so we're going to charge you next to nothing for exporting income statement balance sheet data, which is what you guys need. Okay, but unfortunately, the expensive data is, hey, I'm doing fixed income in Europe from 20 years ago for these specific markets. Well, that data is very expensive, and it doesn't take much of that data export before they shut you down for an entire month. The reason I say this is because the people that have discovered our little fight club lab are the PhDs. And so what they do, like locusts, is they come in here and they start at the terminals and they start exporting. And when the terminal runs out, they go to the next machine. And they keep working through the machine until they use up the entire lab. And they know about the data export limits, so they rush in here at the beginning of the month to get as much data as they can before the terminals get shut down. So I say this because when you're doing your assignments in this class, and there's nothing we can do because it's a school lab to prevent these people from coming in the room and, and wrecking our class. But basically, if you're at a terminal, the symptom is that you data export to Excel, and that's the limitation. Like screenshots, Bloomberg doesn't care. But exporting to Excel is what Bloomberg cares a lot about because, again, they're trying to protect their database. So here's the point. If you go to data export and nothing happens, you're going to have to go to another terminal because that means that machine is timed out until the first of the next month, okay? So I'm just letting you know. So if you keep hitting export and it doesn't export, because what's happening is they shut down the API and they won't let it export through the API until they reset that. But it's by terminal, okay? So the terminal next to you might not have hit that limit. But what I have found over the last couple semesters is the PhDs tend to roam in patterns. Okay, so they usually start at the ends and they work their way towards the middle. So usually the middle systems are the last to be wiped out. Okay, but I'll also tell you the ones downstairs get wiped out the fastest. So my only other recommendation to you is don't spread the word about this class. Like keep it to ourselves. Okay, because basically at this point of the semester, you're going to be competing with everybody else for exporting data. That being said, doesn't matter, you still got to do it for your assignment. So, Back to this. <clears throat> so today, I want to talk about Nike and the process for doing the bull, the bear, <clears throat> and the uh, the target. So let's go back to Nike. So we're going to take our as-is model. Okay, so you should have the one that you submitted for your homework today. And again, just to remind ourselves what the as-is model is, because that's something relatively unique to our class. So again, the point of the as-is is we said, okay. Given the current share price and given a DCF model, we work backwards to say, what are the realistic cash flow assumptions that led to that share price? And again, it's not whether you agreed with the assumptions, it's just these are what the assumptions have to be. Okay? So we're going to start with that. So let's do the bear, or sorry, the bull first. So file, save as, and then put this in my... Nike, and instead of as is, I'm going to call this the bull. And I'm going to save the file. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about my key assumptions. So the assumptions that are going to be most important are revenue growth rate, EBITDA margin, tax rate, and any productivity assumption in the balance sheet. And generally, we're leaving the productivity assumptions alone for most companies. Then we'll go to over here to assumptions. I'll change my G and I'll change my WAC. 
Okay, those are really the five things. Revenue growth rate, EBITDA margin, tax rate, G, and WAC. That have the most important impacts. That's your 80-20 or even 90-10 rule. Okay, and that's where we're gonna start for most of our assumption changes. By the way, I'm gonna take one of them off the table because your WAC should actually not change. All right, because, and this is how I can tell whether you read the book or not, because basically, if you start changing your WAC, you didn't read the book, because the idea is that in Medigal Annie Miller, we do a target share price based on a constant capital structure. So if you have a target capital structure, which is constant, you don't vary your WAC. Okay? So if you're varying your WAC, you're saying your capital structure is bouncing around. And we're not doing that. We're leaving the capital structure alone. That's why we leave the WAC alone. Right? So I'll just talk about it practically. Because there's really two ways to assess risk to a company. Right? There's the broad sort of approach to say, okay, I know that, that Nike is going to be risky, so I'm just going to arbitrarily raise their WAC. Well, that's a very blunt instrument. So I'm just going to cut the valuation by 15% because I raised your WAC. Okay? Or a better way to do this is to say, your growth rate is not going to be as high, your margins are going to be lower, you're going to pay more in taxes, and these are the challenges you're going to have in your market. Like That also gets you to a lower share price. So in our class, our preferred method, and by the way, I think this is more preferred in the real world as well, is let's talk more about the cash flow side than the WAC side to assess the risk of the market. So that's what we're doing in the bull and the bear. So I want you to kind of leave the WAC alone, but I'll also put an asterisk by this, because every now and then, Bloomberg screws up, right? So there's mistakes I've seen in Bloomberg, and if there's some like really crazy whack, you might have to change it, right? I don't think PBH is that example, but nonetheless, I have seen some problems with data coming from Bloomberg. Got to be practical about that. So every now and then, we may have to change the whack, but generally, we're not looking to change the whack. Okay? We're looking to say, okay, given the level of risk, which should be based on long term. Let's change the other four primarily. Now, again, you can change anything in the model that you want, but these are the four that I want to focus on. I'll also say that for the next class, we're going to talk about how to change the G. Okay? So right now, I'm going to give you an arbitrary G for PVH. Okay? And we're just going to all use that G. Okay? And the G that we're going to use is 1%. Okay, so by the way, if anybody's watching this video for the 11 a.m. section, I forgot to mention this. So 1%, and I'll put this up there in the assignment, is the G I want you to use for PVH. Okay, for Nike, we're leaving at 3%. So I don't want you to change that G uh, for Nike in the bull and the bear. Okay, but for PVH, we are going to change the G. Okay, in our as-is model. And in the bull to bear scenario, here's the point, okay? You possibly could change your G and your bull and your bear, and you eventually will, right? But for now, I'm going to leave it alone, because here's the point of G. G is the growth and the perpetuity. So you're talking about the long-term growth of the company. So you actually may change your G when you actually talk about your bull and your bear. Because if I think they have more positive prospects long-term, they should have a higher G long-term in the perpetuity, right? And worse prospects, lower G. Okay. But for simplicity today, I'm going to focus more on the other factors um, and leaving the G alone for Nike's as is. But we could talk about the G. So let's come back to ratios. Growth, EBITDA, tax. So again, we're now in the bowl. What could go well for Nike over time? Well, this is where research comes in. Okay, We have to go look at the real world. So first, you might want to look at IBIS. Read the IBIS World Report for Nike. Okay, kind of like dual five forces without doing the five forces, just to get a sense of what's going on with Nike. And second, we might want to look at some of the analyst reports. Or third, we might want to go to like Bico. So let's go to Bico. Let's get a few headlines on Nike. So a few things we'll see about Nike. All right, and we also have company and industry. But first of all, Nike is doing this productivity initiative. Okay, they're calling it the triple double. Right? And so the whole point is, they're actually attacking the balance sheet. And they're saying, we think we can get rid of some inventory. We think we can be more efficient in our supply chain. We think we can actually have better productivity on our balance sheet. And that will actually lead to lower cost and less investment. So when we talked about not changing the balance sheet ratios, we could actually slightly change the balance sheet ratios. So how would I do that? Well, what I could do is I can come in here and say, okay, in my bull scenario, I'm going to come down here to inventory, which used to be 15% of sales. 
and say maybe inventory goes down to 10% of sales. Okay, so they're going to get rid of the inventory because they're just much more efficient in their supply chain. Okay, and that gets them a couple dollars a share price. Okay, now next tax rate. Anything I think is going to happen in Nike's tax rate in the next couple of years that's going to really benefit them in the bull scenario. Is tax rate going to go lower? Realistically, probably not. So even in the bull scenario, I'm probably going to leave the tax rate alone because I don't think it's going to get too much better than 16%. Okay. And by the way, word to the wise, um, Michael Bloomberg of Bloomberg had a really good editorial last week right before the Democratic debates. And what he said is he's thinking about getting into the presidential election because he said the Democrats may become unelectable because they're basically spinning untrue fairy tales and making shit up. To the, to the American public that can't possibly be done, right? And I'll give you an example. Elizabeth Warren's um, Medicare for All, or whatever she's calling it, has a 0% probability of being enacted, even if she's elected. It will not happen, because as long as there are 40 Republicans in the Senate, that bill will not pass. And so Michael Bloomberg's entire, you know, basically op-ed is, look, guys, be realistic. Like, you can say you're doing all these things, but when you actually have to govern and you actually have to implement things, no one's going to approve your fairy tale plans. It's just not going to happen. So let's talk about what you can do, not what's a fairy tale. And I want to use that metaphor about this uh, bull scenario. Like, you could say the tax rates are going to go to zero, right? Because somebody's going to win the election and a possible scenario and do away with taxes, but that's not going to happen. So what I mean is it needs to be a realistic bull. It can't be a fairy tale bowl. Okay? So let's go back. Tax rate's probably not going to help. But let's see what else they're doing. Let's think about growth and margins. Let's skim through this real quick. All right. They're going to do under $100 shoes, possible makeover. So they're going to focus more on affordable shoes, because I don't know who can afford these Air Jordans they sell anymore. But in any event, um, apparently somebody's buying them. They also say, that uh, Olympics are going to help them because they're sponsored the Olympics. But the big one here is digital is going to help. Uh, Nike app is going to in increasingly help with the digital online, which is going to be important as we're in the retail apocalypse. Uh, but they got a lot of endorsers. But the big one on here is women. That women actually is about double the size of men's global apparel. And they actually see growth in the women's apparel market, particularly in athleisure. So that's already one area they see of growth. <clears throat> and so that's the point. If they actually grow that women's business faster, then that can be part of the bull scenario. In fact, the other bull scenario is Asia and specifically China, which they also see as a big market for them. And then the final one they talk about is how they dominate the uniforms for all their athletic teams. Okay, so here's the point. Let's translate. Okay, now again, I want to be realistic because Nike is already a forty-something billion dollar company, and we already have eight percent growth baked in. So growing at twenty percent a year, I'm not sure that that's realistically bullish. But if they get more women. If the trade war for China quickly calms down and the American companies are not prohibited from expanding in China because of the fights that we're having, and then Nike's actually able to capitalize on that. And at the same time, if they start seeing more success in the under $100 market, so they're more accessible to a larger part of the population, what do you think that means to extra growth? Said so 8%, how high could it be? I'm sorry? Nine? Okay, nine, call 10, or even 11. You can get in that range, but that doesn't sound too unreasonable to me. Because again, we're talking about an extra 3% on 40 billion. Okay, so it doesn't, that's not too much money there. So again, here's the thing. In my bull model, I'm gonna put these back to yellow, just to know that I changed them. And this year, I'm probably not gonna change too much, but they're in fiscal 2020 now, almost halfway through. So maybe this one's going to be nine, 
and this will be 10. And then I'll let 10 carry through. Right? Now, what, what could happen to the margin side? By the way, I'm going to 106. Now, I'm going to be careful about the compounding effect of all of this. Right? Because what looks like small incremental changes, as I incremental, 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 I can come up with something crazy. Okay? So, you've got to be careful about that. But that being said, could they do anything that could help their margins here? Or are their margins already kind of peaked? And just again, if we look historically, they were around 15s, and the market thinks they're going to get up to 16s. Well, let's say that they get a little bit more in perpetuity. Instead of 15, 6, they do 16. It's the third number in there. All right, now I'm at 109. Okay. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to call this my Nike bull. And I would have started writing my write-up, and I would explain that. I would say, all right, I changed the growth rate to X, and I changed my margin to Y. I left the tax rate alone. I didn't really change the G, although I probably would have upped the G a little bit okay, in reality. And I would have said these reasons, because they're going to get more sales in the women's market faster, because the trade war is going to simmer down, and their expansion in China is going to continue at a much more rapid rate than we think right now. And because they're starting to go to the under $100 market, I think that they're going to get expansion. Although I do think the under $100 market is going to cap some of their margin improvements. Okay, So that's why I don't think the margins actually go much uh, much higher. But at the same time, I do see higher growth. And that's what leads me to $109 stock price for Nike in the next 12 months. Yes? Well, if, if you were actually doing this, you would actually kind of have data about how big China is. You'd have Mark, Nike's market penetration. You'd look at revenue based on that, and you'd add it to Nike and do real percent changes, right? But here, I'm saying take a swag. I'm being semi. And you're undergrads, and we're, we got a week to do the assignment. So, but basically, you know, just take a, a realistic swag. And, and at this point, some of you are like, "Well, I haven't done this before." That's why we're starting out with the trading wheels on these assignments. Like we're starting out with relatively easy companies. PBH is a mature company, so you're, you're not going to see them like doubling sales organically overnight. Okay, nothing against PVH, but realistically, you know, you're, you're going to see a stable thing, so it's not going to go crazy. Right? But nonetheless, this is really the art of valuation. The more you do it, the more you sense of it. But this is why I say, read the industry reports. Read the analyst reports. Read through the JP Morgan report. See what they have to say. I'm not saying you can't use it. Just don't plagiarize them. You know, cite this stuff. So again, if, if you're help, getting help with this, all the better. That's how you're going to learn. Emulate what you see. But the point is, you can also look at the range of the ANR. Because you can actually see what some of the top end analysts are putting for their 12 target stock, target stock prices. You can see what some of the analysts are putting for their targets for the lows. So that also would see the bull and the bear range. Because I wouldn't expect your bull to be that much higher than what the real world says, even the most optimistic analysts. And I wouldn't see your bear being too much lower than what the, the worst of the analysts have to say. So use that information as well. Right, other questions? Yes? So are only the way right now is Correct. Yeah, I need you to start, and this is going to be very important for what you're starting at. Okay, so again, I saved my file, I made my changes, I explained to you what my change is, and I typed it up. Okay, second, third file, that was my second file. File, save as. Now, it might be easier <clears throat> to actually go back to my as is just so I know what I'm starting off with. Save as and go to my bear. Now, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I'm in a foul mood, and I want to know what's going to go wrong. Okay, So now I'm just looking at everything that's going to go wrong in the next 12 months with Nike. Again, realistically wrong. So what are some of the things, given what we just said, and, and some of these assumptions that could actually get worse. So let's start out. Tax rate, could that go higher? Realistically, how high? In the next 12 months, how high do we believe the tax rates are going to go long term? Yeah. I'll get at least go up to what the stated corporate tax rate is. 21. So it could start heading towards the 21% rate. So give me a number. 21. All right. Put 21, 
you're down to 88. But here's the thing. I need to know a rationale for why it would go to 21, which means that's 100% of their sales in the U.S. And Nike's not just selling in the U.S. So part of the reason why they don't even pay the 21 is because they're selling in other jurisdictions. So we would have to ask to probably change the tax laws to get us to really 21. So it's not that I'm saying what you said isn't possible, but this is why if you go back to our reality checks, realistically, are they going to pay 21 worldwide? If, you know, what percentage are sales in the U.S.? So maybe not 21, but maybe, I don't know, 18, something like that. <clears throat> now, you could make a case that the Democrats do win. They end up controlling all three houses post-election, and they start raising the corporate tax rate above 21. And you could make an argument that longer term, that number could be higher, right? But nonetheless, I, I want you just to, to, to give me reasons to go with the numbers, right? What about uh, growth or margin? What could hurt them on the growth side? Yeah. Trade war. Yeah, the continued trade war. So, for example, you know, we're already seeing reports out of this, but American companies are not doing great in China, right? So, essentially, if, if we see these trade war retaliations and it continues long term, that could be bad for a lot of their growth strategy because a lot of their growth is in Asia, and that's where the trade war is, is taking some big hits. So a continued trade war may actually be bad for Nike. What also could hurt their growth long term? Or even midterm? Yeah. Uh, their bet on that leader for women not turn out well. Exactly. So just because they see the market doesn't mean that women are going to essentially buy at the scale that they hope. And maybe they don't penetrate that market as well as they think. All right? What else? You could argue, and there's just, I kind of think there are five forces. Yeah. Uh, there you go. All this dominance for sports teams and to some degree the athleisure market, challenged by companies like Under Armour, Lululemon, et cetera, and everybody else is moving into the athleisure world. In fact, when you read about PVH, you're going to read about their move to athleisure and denim. Okay. That's going to be part of what they're going into. Everybody's going after this market. Maybe they're not going to get as much of the pie as they thought. So let's translate. What does that mean for these growth rates? And again, I'll remake these yellow to what? So again, this year is about halfway over on the fiscal. This is based on May. So it's probably not going to be too much lower than 8%, but maybe it's like 7.5. They missed their numbers. How much could they decrease in the next couple years? How about 6 Let's go to six. And because they're in the $100 shoe market, maybe this cl gets closer to, and again, I'll make these yellow again. <clears throat> EBITDA, historically closer to high 15s. So instead of getting up to 16, maybe they don't bridge 16, they get to 15.9. And they can't get past that. Nine. Well, guess what? Now I'm at an $84 share price. Okay, that's my bear. So I got a bull, around 110-ish, whatever it was. I got a bear, which I'll save 84. I've explained the rationale for my bear, which says, continued trade war hurts particularly sales with the growth that they expected in China. They have increased competition, which is challenging some of the growth in ass leisure and maybe they're not as successful in the transition to the women's business and the push to grip more women's sales and apparel as they, they expected. And the $100 undershoe sale market isn't as attractive as they thought it was. So therefore, 84. Market overshot a little bit. Okay? So I've now established a clear range, high and the low. Our final step, target, where in that range do we realistically think they're going to be? So what do you think? I've given you two scenarios on both ends, and we already know kind of the, the baseline scenario. You think, where are they going to end up? Is Nike a buy, sell, or hold? What's your gut feel? How about show of hands? Or, go ahead. Yeah. 
right? So you think they're they're fairly priced and the, the market has it right. Okay. By the way, there's that's the this is the one answer I really can't grade you on very well. Because I can't tell you that your target is wrong. Because I don't know, even the analysts. Look at the AR screen. The analysts don't even agree on what Nike's gonna be. So how can I say that you are wrong on this assignment? So you might say, well, then how am I going to be graded? That's a very fair question. So the way I'm going to grade you is on your assumptions. Are you putting in realistic assumptions, and are you backing it up with fact-based data and following the process in this class? Right? That's how you're going to be judged and graded. Okay? So basically, making stuff up really quick is going to leave the poor grades, especially if it's lacking data to back up your assumptions or just putting in assumptions without facts, okay? That's the other thing that kind of hurts your grade, because that's what you're gonna be doing, right? So this one, like I said, if he says hold, can't say he's wrong. In fact, somebody could have said, you know, hey, I have a more negative opinion on Nike, I think they're overvalued. Or somebody could say, you know what, they got it wrong. Nike's gonna, you know, really innovative company, they're gonna actually conquer and do even better. So all of them could be right, don't know, but you give me the scenarios, now you just give me your opinion. So those are gonna be the four files you'll turn in, the as is, the bull, the bear, and the target, and then you're turning your write up and the three screenshots to support the original data. Okay. Questions? Yes? Three screenshots is for the as is. That was just for the as is. Correct. Yeah, just for the DES. And it's also very important for the DES as well because you're going to do the PBH assignment at a different time just because I'm giving you a week to do it. And so I don't know what the share price is when you do it. And since we got 160 people to create with 160 different share prices, the only way we can grade it is as of the time of your valuation. That's the other reason for that screenshot. Yeah. Um, so you do our as is everything the same way you did it with Nike. You're doing this exact same process for Nike for PBH, which we're going to do in just a second, just so you can preview what we're about to do. Yes. Oh, I hope not. That's why I'm I'm alerting you that when you export the data, if you can't export it from a machine, you may have to go to a different machine. You're just exporting data. Screenshots are not data limit. It's just the financials. But unfortunately, as I said, if the, the terminal hits its data limit for the month, it doesn't matter how cheap the data is. They just stop exporting. Right? Now, again, I think even in the room right now, some of you are exporting. If it's exporting, most of these terminals are okay. But as we get later in the month, I just want you to be aware, depending because we're now getting to what is today, 20, 21st. The later we get in the month, the more the terminals get shut down. Okay? And I just wanted you to be aware of that problem because it can be very frustrating. You're in the lab, it's Saturday, nobody's around. You're like, why won't this machine give me the data? It worked before. Why isn't it not working now? It's probably symptomatic that it hit its data limit. And unfortunately, Bloomberg doesn't tell you that it hits its data limit. It just stops exporting. Yeah. Would it make sense for our target value to just be the average of our bull and bear value? No. I mean, you could do it that way, but that's where I get into the arbitrary range. That seems arbitrary to me. <laughs> Like, why is it the average of the bull and the bear? I'm asking, I'm asking seriously, why, why would it be the average of the bull and the bear? Just like it's the median. Like okay, it's but that's just an argument for the median. That's not an argument for the, tar for the target. Okay. That's what I mean. Like, that's the one thing, and this is the hardest part, is I just don't like arbitrary ranges. I'm not saying that your target couldn't be in the, right in the middle. It could split the hairs. But I, I need to know why. Okay? Because that, that's what I said. The problem is, if I just say Nike plus or minus 10%, why not Nike plus or minus 15? Why not Nike plus or minus 20? Why'd you do average? Why didn't you do some other method? Like, there's there's no really rationale for that. So put yourself in the shoes of the institution you're selling the research to. If you just gave me an arbitrary range, that doesn't help me at all. How do I do portfolio analysis when I don't really know what the range of my portfolio is and your basis for doing it? Other questions? Yes. Um, so we're only changing the numbers that we change in the class? You, if you want to go further than what I have given you, you're always welcome to change anything in the model so that you follow two rules. Number one, be reasonable. Mm -hmm. And number two, back it up. Because again, we're dealing with the real world. And you may, you may come across some research that says, so for example, in the 11 a.m. section, I didn't actually mention changing the balance sheet for Nike. Okay? It just so happened that I looked over uh, between the breaks, between the sections, and I, I remembered that they had that triple-double thing going on. And so I you know, made the assumption here. So we didn't change the balance sheet there. They, it'll be okay. They, but again, the more you learn about these companies, the more models you'll be more realistic. And that's what we really want to try and get to. 
but at the same time, I, you know, in the first model, I'm not trying to overwhelm you with too much. I want you to spend hours and hours and hours in this assignment yet. Now, just one last thing I'll mention before we actually get to PBH, which is this is the same sort of process you're going to do for your group projects. So one last thing that's very important about your group projects, and we'll get this on the video, <clears throat> which is remember that our final week of class, I think it's Monday, December 4th and 6th, I believe. Is that Monday and Wednesday? No, you're finally week of class, full week of class. Let me double check. It's December. December 2nd and 4th. So on the syllabus, if you remember, those are mandatory attendance days. Right? So just be really, really clear. You have to be here the entire time, both days. And if you miss one of those days, you're guaranteed to lose between 5 and 25% of your semester grade. If you miss both of those grades, you will fail this class. So you have to be here. Okay? And this will require, like, if you're in the hospital, I will actually want to see, like, a photo of your foot in a harness or something like that showing that you're actually injured, okay? So the reason why, <clears throat> those are the only two mandatory days really I'm having this semester, but it's going to be very important, and whether you're presenting or not, you're going to listen to the other teams that are presenting, okay? So let's say that we have six teams. Each team is going to have 30, or sorry, 20 minutes to present. So there'll be three presentations on Monday, three presentations on Wednesday. You'll be here both days. But I'm also making a change, and going back to the way I used to do it this semester, and I didn't do it this way last semester, but every member of every team is going to present. So if you have six people on your team, all six people must be here and presenting during the 20 minutes. You can't just have one person do the entire presentation. So if you have stage fright, get over it. Okay? You got about 45 days to, to figure that out. Now, I'm not going to grade you on style points per se. And if you need to, to write down note cards to basically say what you need to say, but you have to say it, and everybody in your team has to split it out. So as far as I'm concerned, if you don't say it, you don't get credit for your group project, which is 20% of your grade. So not only must you be here, you must also present. Okay? So that's why you can't miss either one of those days. So back to this. Let's talk about your PVH assignment. So your homework assignment, homework A for PVH, is to basically do this process using this model for PVH. So you're going to do it as is a bull bear and a target with a write-up and the screenshots along the way. So let's talk about how we're going to do this. So the first thing I'd recommend is start out with, save my bear. And by the way, I, I kind of skipped over this, but for the target Excel file, basically you've just put in your final assumptions for what you think the target could be, and then just write that up. Okay? So we can have a range of, of what that will be and save that as a fourth file. All right, so let me go back to my as is for Nike. I got a lot of files. Oh, where's my Nike? There's. All right, so you've already done this, but just in case you forgot or can't find it for your last homework assignment, you get a PVH US equity. The first step is you would have gone to FA custom. You'd have taken your model template, or whatever you called it, that you exported the PVH data, and you exported it to Excel, the current template, right? And you should have replaced all the long dashes with zeros, and that would be your data file. Now, you've already submitted this as a homework. So you should technically have this file, but you're welcome to do it again. Data should have changed. But nonetheless, this is where we have started with the PVH data. Okay. So now what we have to do is we have to update our Nike model with PVH's data. So again, we would select all of this data, copy it. We would go to the valuation model for Nike. We would go to our model data tab, select the whole tab, right click, paste special values, and overwrite the Nike data with the PVH data. We then would go to the CFI and make sure that it still balances. That was our balance check. Okay. And then file, save as, and I'll put this in my homework eight folder. This is my valuation model 
for PVH as is on the video that I'm going to use. So now I'm doing my as is for PVH. Okay? And now I need to start updating some things. So first of all, <clears throat> I'm going to come in here to assumptions. I'm going to start updating my assumptions. My last reported year was 2019, so I don't have to change that. Okay. Next one is my WAC. So I would go to Bloomberg, type in WAC, take the screenshot up here, save the screenshot, and type in my WAC. Okay, so I replace it with the WAC. Right. For G, as I said, 1%. It's going to sound arbitrary today. Next week's class, we'll talk about how we estimated G. But I did a little bit of an as-is on PVH earlier before I did the assignment, and I'm just telling you 1% will be easier to make it work and probably more realistic given the current share price today. Okay. Next, we'd have to put in the shares outstanding. DES. Again, take the screenshot because you're going to need this current share price, 90.09, and you're going to need this share count, 74.1 million. So you put in the share count, and 74.1, and whatever it was, 90, 90, whatever it was, 90.06. So that's why you take screenshots, by the way. <laughs> it changes. And you put in the the uh, the price, and then you go to screen number three, EEO. And again, file, take screenshot, save, PVH EEO, and you put in or whatever you want to call it, you put in the, the revenues for the next three years and the EBITDAs for the next three years. Okay, so start typing it in, but like this would be 97.68 as an example. And for EBITDA, this would be 12.60. Not gonna do the other years because you do it yourself. Right? And then don't forget to change this forward revenue and EV to EBIT. 2021, second forward year. EV to sales is 1.11. And EV to EBIT is 11.65, which leads me to about a 9.5% operating margin. Then you're going to come over here to ratios. And we're going to basically put in a realistic tax rate. Okay. Now, one of the things I like to do, because I could have overwritten this previously, is if I started playing around with this, I might just want to take these numbers and say equal previous year. And just copy them over just to start my file again and the reason why is because somebody did this earlier the PVH margins are going to be a lot lower than 15.6 percent EBITDA okay it's going to be closer to what I see it here 12.9 so if I forget to update my EBITDA margin here in perpetuity then I'm going to start getting a really weird share price so just remember what I changed, because when you reuse these models, the Nike assumptions are still there. Any changes you made for Nike are carried over. So just double check that you don't have any weird Nike data when you start putting the PVH, because PVH is a much smaller company than Nike. Okay. So nonetheless, I have to change this margin, change EBITDA, change the tax rate, change the growth rate, and get this to within a dollar a share. As I said, if I start leaving in some of the Nike assumptions, I'm going to get a crazy share price. Okay? Because, again, the key here is PVH of sales, Nike sales. PVH EBITDA, Nike EBITDA. Right? They're just, Nike's a bigger company. So if I don't change that, I'm going to get really weird stuff in my model. Okay? And as I said, the standard that we're going to use is within $1. Okay? So when you change all this, you need to get within a dollar of the current share price. Right? Yes? No, dollar plus or minus. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd like to be closer to 50 cents. Like, the, the more, the better. But I just, I don't want you to get into this, you know, i got to be exact match because then it gets really to be 
an exercise, almost like futility. So by the way, really quick, uh, 10044. Let's get a change of magnitude. Oh, what do we got here? 10394. Twelve sixty, thirteen twelve, and thirteen fifty four. Okay. By the way, notice the share price a little bit more realistic. But as I said, I still have <clears throat> this margin, which I'd hard coded in, which was Nike's perpetuity margin. Remember, because we tried to, to match this number based on this number, which is 9.5%. So to make this number 9.5%, instead of 12.1, I had to make this, what's that, 13? Which gets me a lot closer to the share price. Okay? So obviously, PVH's growth rate might be a little bit lower in the future, but I'm going to stop right there. So here's the thing. You're going to start seeing some ugly numbers for PVH in the next few years. Right? And I just want to let you know that when you start looking at PVH, FA, as an example, and you go to uh, segments, and we go to geography, you can see that Europe is a big part of their business and Asia is the fastest growing part of their business. Okay? So all I'm saying is if you're wondering why you're gonna be looking at some really ugly numbers at the current share price, well, we got a crazy man in the White House starting to fight with everybody. And unfortunately PVH is kind of caught up in some of this. Right? And by the way, PVH's brand, all about the USA. If you ever watch Tommy Hilfiger, it's basically our flat. Okay. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I think that's a cool thing. But right now, in trade wars, that's the type of stuff that could be taken a hit. So you go back and we start looking at their current share price. I think there's a, my sense is, there's some pessimistic things that people have about them. So you're probably going to see some ugliness in it. But again, you're going to do your own modeling. But you're going to do your as is. And remember, as you're going through the as is, you might not agree with it. And that's okay. Because that's not the point of the as is. The as is says, their share price is $90. I need to explain what makes it $90. Not whether I think it should be $90. It is $90. Why is it $90? This is what would have to come true. Okay? In fact, the other thing we have to do is we have to look up the tax rate. Remember, to look up the tax rate, you've got a couple places to look at it. Number one, you can look at EVT. And you can look up the transcript and see whether Manny or Mike, sorry, Manny Sharico is their CEO, Mike Schaefer is their CFO, uh, whether they talked about it on the quarterly call. Sorry, work with these guys. Uh, second, you could look at the JP Morgan reports. Remember, the JP Morgan specifically has a forecasted tax rate in the BRC. So that's some ways you can get it. But basically, you're going to need to get a, a realistic tax rate for PV8, so we have to change the tax rate. And as I said, if you want to change the balance sheet and you see something that they're doing there, you're welcome to, to do it. But generally, the balance sheet isn't going to change too much and probably won't have the biggest impact. But nonetheless, you'll do the as is, save it, explain why you made the things that you did. That one's the easiest one, why I put the numbers in. And then work your way through. All right, save bull. Why did I change the bull? What did I change in the bull? Here is the supporting data. Where did I get supporting data? I got it from IBIS, I got it from BICO. You know, I go through, oh, BICO. Oh, they don't have a BICO. Okay, can't use BICO. All right, so I have to do something BI. I look through the industry BI, Bloomberg Intelligence on their industry. Go through apparel, see what it says about the apparel industry. Okay, read the IBIS report, read some analyst reports. Because again, remember the analysts are doing the same thing we are. So under BRC, Read a couple of the analyst reports. But the whole point is synthesize that into your bowl, explain your assumptions, save, bear, synthesize assumptions, bear, target, where do you think they're going to end up? Then buy, sell, hold. That's your assignment for next month. Questions about your assignment? That's an individual assignment, it's not a group assignment. Yes? What happens if you finish changing on the 
have this network, there's still value for the dollar. You gotta get rid of the dollar. <laughs> You have to get to a dollar. You can change other things besides. At the end of the day, you can change other things so long as you can explain to me plausibly why you did it. All right. And I will tell you, um, and I choose I choose these companies intentionally. Sometimes, sometimes it's good lucky with these assignments. This is not an easy assignment. This actually is going to be harder than Nike. Nike is easy. It really is. All right? Because to some degree. They're really straightforward to forecast, everybody agrees. PVH, you're gonna quickly find that they seem to deviate from the consensus. Like the actual share price doesn't reflect the true consensus of what the analysts say. And so what ends up happening is sometimes the, the sell side gets ahead of the buy side, the buy side gets ahead of the sell side, and I don't think you get a clear consensus with PVH amongst the buy and the sell side today. That's just my opinion looking at the as-is valuation. So the, I'm just going to translate. So basically what's happening is there's a lot of uncertainty with the stock. Okay, And it has to do with the fact that half their sales are international and their biggest growth markets are Europe and Asia. And right now the U.S. is picking fights with all these countries. And does that affect them? I think the market's worried about it's affecting them. And oh, by the way, we have tariffs and trade wars. So those are the types of things that could be affecting PVH and their growth prospects and their margin prospects. And by the way, currency. Currency is another big one that affects this company. Okay, So what's going to happen to the currencies based on these trade wars? Is it favorable to them? Is it unfavorable to them? These are some things in the real world that people are considering. So let's go back. When we do these bull and the bears, you might see that to some degree their price is probably biased towards one side versus the other. And so when I go back to in the as is, you might have to do some things. You're like, this seems pretty awful. Right? And it just means that you might be near the bear range and you have to then come up with a different bull and probably a more reasonable target. Or you might say, you know what, it's not awful enough. So again, you'll, you'll basically have to do this. But this one's a little bit more tricky because it's not just like when we did Nike, we plugged in the initial baseline assumptions and we were already within a couple dollars of their share price. When you plug in the baseline assumptions, you're going to be like 30 or $40 from the share price. And so you're going to have to make some, you know, choices about, well, how did the market get rid of that extra $30? What did they do? Right? And then put that into your analysis. Yes, sir? Um, with, so for this assignment, the only three things we're changing our revenue? No. Is you, you potentially could change growth rate, EBITDA margin, tax rate, and you could change the balance sheet. Okay? I don't really want you to change the G, but if you want to make an argument to change the G, you potentially could. And again, you can ignore me and change WAC, even though you'll do that with your peril. But nonetheless, you could change anything, right? And that's the point. Like, we're having to try and generate the cash flows. But I'm saying most of them will be on the others, those three. But you could change something else if you have to, okay? So if you want to make an argument that long-term growth is lower than what I gave you, you potentially could. But I've tried to save you a little bit of that, and I put in what I think is as a reasonable as is for the G. That's where I already lowered it from three to one, okay? Because if you think about this, long term, if you put their growth rate at like zero or negative, you're basically saying that Tommy Hilfiger, Calvin Klein's decline. That's just not what's happening in the real world. Like the, the jeans business is actually coming back. Um, you know, they're both doing pretty well in some of their marketplaces. And, and so I think a lot of the cloud over the company, and you're going to see this when you analyze it, is just the short term. And this is the cloud over retail in general, right? But long term, as, as the CEO of CEO of Manny, Shiriko, uh, actually said, he's like, look, um, a paraphrase, but we we're in a session at Warden, but he was in the room, and the conversation was that, you know, people are still going to buy clothes. Like, who they may buy clothes for are going to change, but they're still going to buy clothes. And they make clothes, right? So you may see Macy's go under, you may see J.P. Penny go under, you see some other changes, but you're still going to buy clothes from somebody. And they're probably going to have a Calvin Klein logo on it, or Tommy Hilfiger will go on in the future. So I think that's their perspective. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but so I'm just saying we have to understand that you know, even when we talk about retail apocalypse, some people are going to be hit harder than others. Now you can make an argument that that's all wrong and they can go away, but that's what I mean by let's be realistic about what we say. So read through it, synthesize, practice writing up the process. Yes? Um, the three screenshots we took, the price changes, so which one do we do? Well, that's what I'm saying. The DES screen that you take, use that price. 
because any time this week, you can start this assignment, including right now. And so what I want you to do is, because you're going to have different screenshots at different times, because you'll have different prices at different times. So we'll basically grade you as of the price of that day. And right now is Monday, and I can't say that bad things aren't going to happen in the market or good things aren't going to happen in the market in the next few days. So the price could actually move dramatically. So it's as of the time of your valuation. But that's also why you want to do the three screenshots relatively close to each other. Because if, you, if the price moves, then the multiples are going to move. And so if you do your EEO screenshot, then that multiple you use to calculate the margin will be different if the price has moved. So do the screenshots relatively close together. Mm -hmm. So with the as is model, are we supposed to do everything that we did with the Nike model? Correct. And then the write-up is for all three of them? Correct. Or like 500 word limit? 500 words for all three. So it's about 125 words per. So we just have one write-up? which you One write-up for all four models. 500 words covers all four models. But there would be the bull, bear, and the as is? The, as is, bull, bear, target. You're going to also tell me about your target. I know we didn't create the target. Uh -huh. But when you do model number four, Excel file number four, you're going to call it, save it called a target. And then in the target, you had to explain to me why you settled on the final numbers you settled on. All right? Because you may not agree with the as is. And you may not, and your bull and the bear, you're going to be somewhere in the middle of that range. So would you change to get your final numbers? And does that create the buy, sell, hold opinion? So that's the final piece of this. That's what the target's all about. And remember, it's a 12-month target. It's what I think it could realistically be in 12 months underline the word realistic okay so as i said you got to be careful about what is practical versus what is not practical when you start doing these things because we could be invaded by mars tomorrow but i can't predict that okay i can't say you're wrong either so there's a low probability all right other questions all right so again you have time on uh wednesday in this lab to, to do this. There won't be a lecture. You have a Bloomberg Lab Day. Uh, here's the thing. If you have questions, TAs have office hours all day Thursday. And you can generally, I'll be very careful about this, so I'll be very specific with my wording here. You can generally help each other so long as you do it yourself. Okay? So you can't turn in somebody else's file. You got to create your own files. You got to take your own screenshots. You got to export your own data. Okay. But if you want to, you know, get help. Hey, did I get the right screenshot? We talk to each other. Like ask questions of the TAs. You have to submit your own work. You can't submit somebody else's work. Okay. But I know you're all struggling with this. So as you struggle, if you need help, you can talk to each other to help each other. But you still got to do the work yourself. Okay. And again, leverage the TAs for this assignment. All right. Last but not least, I just want to mention one more word about the stock sim. So the stock sim rankings were posted last week. And so again, you're continuing to trade second half of the semester. Rules generally apply. Here's the key. Whatever number of longs were on that screenshot for your team, you need 10 incremental more in the second half of the semester. Okay. So make sure you have to not only maintain a portfolio, but you have to make a minimum 10 more longs to successfully meet the criteria for the second half of the semester, and you still can't be more than 30% in cash at any time. So you still have to be invested in the marketplace. Okay? Yes, sir? You need 10 more by the second deadline. So you got a few, about a month to do that. Yeah. If you enter 10 new logs and then close out 10 other logs? No, it'll just keep adding to the list. Yeah. You can't just close out your whole portfolio, but you, yeah, you can basically replace, it'll just keep adding to them because it just tallies number of ones. All right. All right. I'll see everybody next Monday. Good luck.